thinking of self kindness or self compassion as a choice, not as a feeling, not as an earned thing. It's just something we can choose to do. Like we can choose to walk to the store, or we can choose to you know get water. Like we can choose to do something nice for ourselves. And there's just going to be so much pushback of like, but you, you know, but you haven't finished your assignment. You haven't replied all your emails. You can't go and like get a donut. That was Dr. Clarissa Ung on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, and co-author of Act Daily Journal. I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist, assistant professor at Brown University, and author of the upcoming book, Work, Parent, Thrive. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty and the Big Book of Act Metaphors. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Psychologists Off the Clock is proud to be partnered with Praxis Continuing Education. Praxis is the premier provider of evidence-based training for mental health professionals. And here at Psychologists Off the Clock, we are huge fans of Praxis. One of the things I love most about Praxis is they offer both live and on-demand courses. So if you're really looking for that live interaction with other people who are taking the course, you can get that. Or if you have a busy schedule and you need something that you can just kind of click onto whenever you have time, they offer that as well. And every course I have ever taken from Praxis has really been of such value to me. I get questions a lot from clinicians who are looking for ACT training or other types of trainings. And Praxis is my go-to place that I send people no matter what level they are because they have really good beginner trainings for people who have no experience. And they also have terrific advanced trainings on different topics and just people who want to keep building their skills. You can go to our website and get a coupon for the live trainings by going to our offers page at offtheclockpsych.com slash sponsors. And we'll hope to see you there. Hi, everyone. It's Debbie, and I'm bringing you today a conversation about anxiety and perfectionism with Dr. Clarissa Ong. Um, We've had a few conversations recently on the podcast about perfectionism, which is, you know, there's a few great books out recently on it. It's a topic that I hear about a lot in my personal life and my clinical practice. So I'm here today with Jill to talk a little bit about the episode ahead. Um, And so let me just pass it over to you, Jill, to tell the listeners some of your thoughts about this topic in this episode. Well, to start, I want to say, Debbie, I really appreciated when you give an example, um, you know, a little bit into the episode, you give your own example where you, you sort of say, you know, I never thought of myself as a perfectionist. And then I realized, you know, some of these behaviors that I exhibit really are kind of related to this overlap between anxiety and perfectionism and the, and the role of uncertainty and the role of lack of control. And, you know, that really got me thinking about myself because I too, you know, don't consider myself much of a perfectionist. And it got me thinking about, hmm, some of the ways that maybe this it, this does play out. And what really stuck out to me in this episode that I think has been different about other episodes was when Clarissa, Clarissa was talking about how perfectionistic behaviors make life easier for other people. And that was a little bit mind-blowing for me. So there's all of this, you know, when you think about some of our other kinds of avoidance behaviors, like procrastination, for example, when I put something off till tomorrow that's dreaded and anxiety-provoking today, I get relief and I feel better. With perfectionism, you know, not only does the person engaging in those behaviors feel better, but at least in a professional context, it's desirable to the to the people that that perfectionistic person is working with. So there's all of this added external validation, but then those same behaviors that are desirable in a work context, I think really come at a cost in a personal context. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I'm with somebody who I think has all of their stuff together and is really perfectionistic, that actually feels intimidating to me and sort of hard to connect with. And so it feels like there's this, I don't know, double-edged sword or, or trying to find this balance, you know, understanding the function, but also really seeing that in some places where there's 
benefit or reinforcement anyway, they're like it really does come at a cost in other ways. Yes, I love this double-edged sword idea here because I do think it drives it, right? It's part of we talked a little bit in the episode about some of the cultural context of it that there's, you know, you may be getting some very strong reinforcement and there's conditioning leading into this behavior. And, you know, people will admire you. People, you do please people and make their lives easier to a degree when you're bending over backwards to do all these things and and all of that. But I think you're right, Jill, that sometimes it also, or it can also lead to some problematic interpersonal issues as well. When you're always in the perfectionism cycle, maybe it doesn't leave enough room to focus on relationships or to be genuine with people. Sometimes people might have a reaction to it. You know, you might, on the one hand, they might admire you. You might get a little almost like envy from people. That can Mm -hmm. kind of, in a strange way, feel a little bit good. Um, But there's a downside to that too, that it might make it harder for people to feel close to you. And, you know, you don't necessarily want that to be the emotion that people are feeling around you is admiration and envy. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. And and it makes me think of the the first time I went to my friend Denise's house, um, you know, we, we got to her house and she didn't clean the house before I got there. And she just sort of like casually apologized for the mess. And I noticed that I breathed this sigh of relief and was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> you know, this is a this is a woman who, you know, she she's like a badass professional who's also a mom. And, you know, to see her house look exactly like mine made me feel so close to her. It made me relax, you know, that that it didn't become this like, oh gosh, like I need to get my act together and I need to there was no competition. There was no comparison. Well, there was comparison, but you know, it wasn't this comparing up and I need to do better. And it was like this, this real moment of connection because I, I just felt like, okay, this is a person that we're like, we can just really be our truly flawed, imperfect selves. And I think if I had gone over and, you know, if her house wasn't remotely cluttered and looked like it came out of the pages of good housekeeping magazine to me, it feels like that may have even created a little bit of distance. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yes. It's funny you say this. There's some examples in the episode about home life, right? Like kind of the household cleanliness and that kind of thing. And I remember when a very good friend of mine came over to my house when I had a baby and a toddler. And I think I'm not a naturally clean person. So a lot of times if I'm having people over or a party or a play date at my house, I will tidy up because it's a little embarrassing to me. Um, But my friend popped over and I was so overwhelmed, I couldn't do it. And she thought it was great. She had like loaded the dishwasher so I could just sit there. And she was like, oh, my house is messy all the time. I'm so happy to know that your house is like this too. And it was funny because what was embarrassing to me at the time was also a source of, it was genuine. It was like, yeah, we're both messy. Let's just be real about that. And it takes, it does take that pressure off and it builds a little bit of closeness. Well, in a personal context, you, you sort of like test these things out and learn, oh, this fear I have that I'll be judged negatively, you know, that there will be some catastrophic outcome if my house is messy. You know, you learn that that doesn't really happen and it's okay. But I kind of wonder if in professional contexts, you don't always get that feedback. You know, the feedback is more on the positive side when you are doing things in a very detail-oriented, perfectionistic way. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And that kind of goes back to your original point here is that that might feed it is that it makes, you know, your boss is going to love it if you dot all of your I's and cross your T's and stay up all night to make everything just perfect with a work project. You're going to get very reinforced with that. But what's the cost, right? You stayed up all night long dotting I's and crossing T's. Yeah. And the two of you talk about perfectionism like it's a rigged game. And you know, it's not a game that you can ever really win, but it feels like you keep getting closer to a win and that's what kind of keeps you going, but that you can't win. And that often that game, playing that game comes at a price. Absolutely. Yes. Well, there were a number of things in this conversation that really got me thinking about perfectionism, about anxiety, about uncertainty, control, indecision, all kinds of things. And so, so whether you are 
anxious, perfectionistic, both. I hope that there's some something in this episode that will be helpful to you. Dr. Clarissa Ong is completing her postdoctoral training at the Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders at Boston University and CB Team. She has a PhD in clinical psychology from Utah State University. She specializes in ACT, process-based therapy, obsessive-compulsive disorder, and perfectionism. And she is a co-author along with Dr. Michael Tuig of the book, The Anxious Perfectionist, How to Manage Perfectionism-Driven Anxiety Using Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Thank you so much for joining me today, Clarissa. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, perfectionism is a topic that a lot of people um, I think will be able to relate to in their lives and something that we've talked about a few times on the podcast before, but you have, you know, a unique spin on it, I think, in your book by really connecting the dots between anxiety and perfectionism, especially, and some of the ways that you approach the topic of perfectionism, I think I'm really excited to talk to you about today. Thanks. Yeah, so, and I'm wondering if we could actually just start with a little bit of a personal note, because you mentioned in the introduction and then a few times in your book that you yourself have struggled with perfectionism, and that that's part of why you do this work. Would you be willing to share a little bit about perfectionism in your life and and what, you know, what kind of brought you into this work based on that, that personal experience? Yeah, definitely. Um, So what initially brought me into the work was that we happened to get a grant there. They happened to need someone to run a study on perfectionism. And I happened to have the time and interest to do it. Um, but my own experience with perfectionism, you know, started before that. So I think um, in when I was in college, I would say that there are lots of behaviors that I would consider perfectionist looking back. So like very concerned about grades and, you know, le- anything less than an A was just terrible and I'm stupid. And, um, and I remember like st- studying for hours for a test that was like maybe worth 10% of my grade and editing papers to the point where I was like changing articles and semicolons. And so um, just being really concerned about doing well to the point that that was all I cared about. Then in grad school, I joined an ACT lab, acceptance and commitment therapy lab. And like the thrust of ACT is about doing things you care about and being able to let, you know, your anxiety and fear and thoughts and rules kind of come along for the ride. And I remember being just super distressed for like two weeks because it just completely like shattered my perception of how things should be. And I was really like in distress because I was like, I can't like, like I just couldn't compute kind of like, what does this all mean? Um, and that's sort of what started sort of my journey toward practicing more acceptance-based um, strategies. And another kind of big turning point, I think, was I attended a self-compassion workshop by Kelly Wilson. And that literally changed my life. Like, I was just came out of it and I was like, oh, my God. Like, I don't know, there's so much about how he talks about um, self-compassion. And I actually think he did that on this show too. I think I listened to he that did. episode. He, we've had him on before. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, I've listened to that episode and I just am like continually inspired by the messages that, you know, he like shares. So yeah, it's in the, you know, this is like six, seven years later from starting to learn about ACT and I'm still learning a lot about the crevices in which perfectionism continues to show up. It's, yeah, I was yeah. actually going to ask you about that because I was going to ask if you feel like you're, you know, in recovery from perfectionism, if you're cured or if you sometimes still notice it in your life now. I know these things don't typically just totally go away. Um, yeah. Are you do, like, I know, I mean, I think even to write a book requires grappling a bit sometimes with perfectionism. Yeah. I think in some ways it's sort of like, um, I think it's Aikido where, you know, you use your opponent's force to help you, you know, or something like that. 
but it's I think it's more learning how to chan- channel that perfectionistic energy toward more like values based pursuits, I guess. So in being able to redirect it when it's not helpful. So I, I guess in so maybe in some ways it's like I've learned to coexist with perfectionism and sometimes we still argue. <laughs> but for the most part we're like learning to get along. Okay. Like a roommate you're getting along with, but trying to trying to coexist. Well actually that's a, a related, I think, to a question that someone on my team wanted me to ask you, which is about uh, so the way that she framed it, yeah, I'll, yeah, this is a yeah, I'll question is about this idea of when to grit and when to quit. And I actually think from your book, it's related to this concept of how you know when perfectionism is helpful versus unhelpful, because I think you're right. Like sometimes, you know, you can't really totally get rid of it, maybe, or sometimes you don't want to. Um, but if you were going to talk to someone uh, either about your own experience or like maybe a client or something like what would you look for to know the difference between like when perfectionism is helpful to you and when yeah. it's a real problem for someone? Yeah, I think on a big picture level, like a question I like to ask for when thinking about values is just do you like your life? Like, are you excited? Or, you know, are you glad to get up in the morning and do the things that you're doing? And I think that's just a really quick like litmus tests for is your life going the way that you want? Um, Are you acting in ways that are consistent with the person you want to be? I feel like those are just sort of big picture questions. And I think that can be helpful for, you know, is perfectionism working or not? But then I think there are like specific contexts and domains in our lives where perfectionism could be really helpful in a certain domain, but not in others, or it could be really helpful at this time, but not a different time. So there's just big picture, like, is this helpful or not? And then there's like, how do I actually apply it? or how to actually use it. And I think that like, when, when do I know to kind of keep going? Or when do I quit? I think there's a bit of that that is trial and error, or requires experimentation of like, I I don't know, but we we just try it out and then contact different consequences and see which one works for you. But I think there's a sense, I think commonly in perfectionism, where it's like, well, then tell me where the new line is, and then I'll do that. Like, tell me the correct oh. answer, right? Like, if it's not my rules, then, okay, values are my new answer. But then the function is still, I'm trying to get the correct answer. Oh, you just, that just kind of blew my mind. It's almost like you get perfectionistic about stopping being a perfectionist, but in this, like, overly rule-governed, rigid way. Yeah. And that's, like, the new perfectionism. That's not really freeing you up. Yeah, exactly. Like I wow. had, I had a recent like self experience with that where I can't remember what it was I was struggling with, and I felt like I wasn't being self compassionate enough, and so I actually got very self critical <laughs> about not being self compassionate enough, and I was like, oh gosh, like this is that pattern, <laughs> this is that unhelpful pattern. I was like, I oh, need to be kinder yeah. to myself. But what's wrong with you? Be kinder to yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of like that. <laughs> Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. Well, what about this idea that, you know, these things sometimes are on a bit of a continuum and people might have maybe even have some perfectionism show up in certain domains, but not others. But I also think it's interesting that word perfectionism that maybe sometimes is overused, similar to OCD, where it's like people are using it in a way that's kind of, you know, just colloquial language around it. But then there's also the really extreme, really, you know, the kind of perfectionism that can really keep people miserable and stuck. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? On like how the, the some of the different forms of perfectionism and how it might show up in some different ways for people? Yeah. So I think, well, so one thing I like to think about too is that the person who seems like they're super you know quote lazy and doesn't get stuff done could also be a perfectionist but I think the most common way we think about perfectionists are those like high achievers like you know like Steve Jobs kind of people and the 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 process that tends to drive people to kind of go all out and you know work 80 hours a week might be similar to the process that's keeping someone from turning in their assignments on time and getting reports done. And I feel like the like procrastinating, like, you know, not producing output 
side of perfectionism gets kind of overlooked. And I think like there's less glory in that form of perfectionism. And so it's, I think it's sort of interesting how we get so much external reinforcement for that, like go, go, go for a form of perfectionism. And I've noticed like being in the Northeast versus being in Utah, like out West, the culture also feels different. Um, like I, I do feel like perfectionism in the sense of like working a lot it is more reinforced here. It's my like personal experience. Um, I would so, agree with that. I lived in Boston for 10 years and now I'm in Denver, which is where I'm from. And I think there's a cultural difference around the the expectations. Yeah. 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 yeah totally. Like I also went to college in Massachusetts and it feels like people like it. Like 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 people are happy when you spend ten hours and give a really good you know like presentation or report. I feel I don't know. So yeah, yeah I, I agree, and it makes life easier for other people, right? Because then they don't have to spend as much time like editing your work. So I just I guess like just noticing that there's a lot of reason why people stay in perfectionistic patterns, even if it's really like stressful for them. Like you get so much external reinforcement for it too. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I want to, I'll just tell a little personal example from myself about, you know, you're talking about different ways perfectionism shows up and sometimes it's not what you think because I have even said on this podcast before that I'm not much of a perfectionist because I'm not, I'm kind of, you know, a little, I'm not that organized. I'm a little, yeah. I can be a little slobbish sometimes, yeah. but this weekend, so we're recording this on a Friday and I have the weekend ahead and I have some family life things I need to do, but I also have a couple deadlines coming up. And I thought I should actually not do, I shouldn't work on anything this weekend. I should do all the family stuff and get some things done around the house. And I was plagued by this panic over it. So that's one example. But then with the house, the the work I need to do around the house, I was really fretting. There's a couple things like we need a new stove and have literally needed a new stove for like a year. Oh. and I haven't bought one. And I just think to myself, like, oh, I'm such a slacker. Why don't I just buy a stove? But it's because I can't decide, like, I don't want to spend that much money, but I also want it to be nice. And I can't decide if it should be gas or electric because gas might be bad for you. But I let, and so it's like, I'm just in a place of indecisive, but it, on the f- surface, it looks like a person who just doesn't have their act together to buy a new oven. Mm-hmm, but it's mm-hmm. actually like, I can't choose the right one. I'm like, there's more perfectionism to that than I realized. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, so the, there's, I think a lot of perfectionism is driven by the rigidity around the rules, like rules by themselves are, you know, neither here nor there. Like I can say like, you know, you should go to the store every day. If you don't listen, like my saying that doesn't do anything. Right. Like, so I think it's that rigidity of like for, with your stove example, it's like, I need to find the right stove. If I don't find the right stove, I'm not getting it. Or at least, you know, or like for me, yeah. it's like I need to be self compassionate, and if I'm not self compassionate, I'm just failing at life. Right? It's that rigidity of like this needs to happen, or like I shouldn't check my emails after 10 p.m. Like, right? Like, so I think that's the part that can uh, can bog people down. It's less that I want to be great; it's that I need to be great at all costs, and if I'm not great, like, yeah, yeah, and there's no flexibility in that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about this link between anxiety and perfectionism. You know, it's in the title of your book, The Anxious Perfectionism. Yeah. And to me, I mean, I see that a lot of times, you know, if you look at anxiety, there might be perfectionism there. If you look at perfectionism, there's anxiety there. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the relationship between the two and how they're, how they intersect, I guess, yeah. how they intersect? Yeah, I think. And like it's different for everyone. I think the motivation behind like doing perfectionistic things, I think two common ones are fear of failure and intolerance of uncertainty are common kind of drivers, right? So I do everything I can because I don't want to fail or I don't try at all because I don't want to fail, right? If I try, then there's a chance I could fail. So I just don't do anything. Um, And then there's the, um, I need to be sure of everything before I can act, right? Like if there's any uncertainty, then I'm not acting. Like I need to spend lots of time problem solving and planning for all the different contingencies because I need that assurance that everything is like working. And those are pretty like 
anxious feelings, right? Like I don't want to fail. I can't if not, and I need to be sure. And if I'm not sure, like that's bad. And there's this like flavor of like catastrophizing and worrying and like, you know, lots of planning. And I think what perfectionism does is it sort of provides a sort of like comforting or protective function of like, it's okay. Like I can give you control in this uncertain world. And so there's a, like, so there is negative reinforcement in that you do the thing and you feel less anxious, right? You plan for 10 different um, outcomes and you're like, okay, now I can go on vacation because I'm prepared no matter what happens. Like, so there is that piece of it relieves some of the anxiety, but I think it also, I don't know. I feel like in, at some point it's sort of like a safety blanket in a way, maybe a very thorny safety blanket, but it has, I think, a bit of that function for some people. And so that's why it's really difficult to let go of because it's like, what if I'm out of control? What if I let go? Because mm-hmm. right? perfectionism is so much about control. And when we're anxious, what we want to do is have control, right? Like, I don't know, I'm really scared of roller coasters. And my instinct is to grab like more onto like the bars to feel in control. But that actually makes the experience less fun. Like the point is to sort of let things happen but I think that's our instinct, like to fix. Yeah, I think that control element, it's a sort of a driver. I mean, all of these things go together, anxiety, perfectionism, control, and kind of, yeah. you know, we have a little bit of a which comes first, the chicken or the egg scenario here, because they're all kind of intertwined. And you could see how that drive for control is really, um, it can feed that, right? Mm-hmm. Like, just that yeah. sense of having to plan for everything and yeah, and that yeah. discomfort when you're not in control, which we often aren't in the world. Yeah, yeah. And almost like by definition, we can't be in control of everything or like that, that's just the way the world works. Like we can't even be in control of our emotions, which is something that's so fundamental to our being. And so I think it's in some ways it like – it's so like, it makes a lot of sense. And it's so valid for people to rely on perfectionism as that sense of like control or safety. And then the unfortunate part is that it, that sense of safety and usually short term sense comes at a pretty high price. Well, and one thing that's, that is interesting to think about is where this comes from, right? Like some of the roots mm-hmm. of perfectionism, you actually wrote in your book that you have a per I love this quote you said you have a personal history that has generously nurtured a need to be perfect I love that idea because it's like something feeds it along the way or there's some sort of you know maybe historic or cultural context in which perfectionism emerges so could what are some of the things that might contribute to perfectionism in a person's history yeah, um, I think some things could be receiving messages from people that we respect and admire. Like, for example, parents or like, you know, caregivers that doing well is good, right? And, um, and that could be implicit or explicit. Like, explicitly, you could be like, oh, like, awesome that you're getting A's in your classes. Implicitly, it could be maybe only giving you positive attention when you come back with a good grade or when you, you know, win some contest, right? That's more implicit. But I think because humans are very smart and we can derive all sorts of relations, right? If I learn that doing well equals good, I can derive that not doing well equals bad, right? Or equals I don't get love or equals I don't get approval, So you almost don't even need that direct experience of someone scolding you for doing poorly. Like we can deduce that because that's how our brains work. So I think enough of those messages, and I think especially coming from people, right? Because as kids, we don't know what's going on. Like we don't know how the world works. And we look to people that we respect and love for cues for how the world works, right? Like maybe it's our teachers and, you know, maybe it's like, people on TV. I don't, I'm I'm not totally sure who kids, you know, look up to these days, but like, so then that's kind of how, like our first, um, I don't know, the first story that we hear about how things work and that, I don't know, I think that can stick, but it's not just that it's that external society reinforces those messages. So there's a lot to 
there's a lot of, I think, credibility in the story that success is good. And I, I, it'd be very hard to find people who disagree with that. I think they're, they're out there, usually therapists, but I think, <laughs> you know, by far, like that's what we learn. And so, yeah. I mean, that's who we see making all this money and being, you know, getting all the accolades and fame or people who are, have done something remarkable like that or who are high achieving. And so it's like, there is that vibe in the world about that. Yeah. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. So for parents who might be listening and seeing some of the early signs of perfectionists, so like say that your child gets really upset if they miss something on a math test, or if your child is terrified of making a mistake or puts a lot of pressure on themselves, and you're seeing that flare of ooh, this looks like early perfectionism. And not to pin it all on parents, because like you said, it's also cultural just in the world around us. But what advice would you give to a parent who is trying not to, you know, to water the seeds of perfectionism? Yeah, Um, I guess before answering the question, I want to add a caveat that I'm not a parent and that I can't fully appreciate the complexities of parenting. Every time I see parents... I'm just like, I don't know how people do this. This just seems like the wildest, most difficult thing. As For the record, parent. I am a parent and I still feel that way sometimes. <laughs> so. so I'll probably give some sort of like non-parent answer where it's like, like, oh, you don't fully appreciate the complexities of parenting. And it's true that I don't. Um, so I think like as a, what, from a behavioral perspective, the thing I think of is providing reinforcement, like regardless of outcome and sort of emphasizing process over outcome where it's like, wow, like you start, you studied really hard. And as opposed to like, wow, you got an A. And Mm. I think, um, and I think maybe even like explicitly undermining those messages and catching ourselves when like, I still fall into that trap of like, oh yes, like, you know, I got like this publication or something. And as opposed to like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that I like created, you know, work to develop this knowledge that can be used to help people in some way so I think and it's so habitual so I think being able to catch ourselves and maybe modeling it in our own behavior right so like hey like I landed this great deal it's like oh I worked really hard and like I made these connections so I think it's just a lot of undermining these messages that we get I think it's the same thing with emotions that we 
we also are often told, you know, you need to be able to control your emotions. Um, Not in those words, but like, oh, you know, just stop crying. Like, oh, like, it's okay, cheer up. Right? These are all implicit messages that we can control our emotions. I think maybe being mindful of the how powerful language is would be yeah. one thing. Yeah, I, I, I'll add one thing to that in terms of the role modeling piece that another parent um, that I know from my kid's school asked me about this one time when she found out I was a psychologist. And my advice, because she herself is a perfectionist, and she said, I'm noticing my daughter, what should I do? And I think actually role modeling making mistakes this can be helpful too. Like, oh, I totally messed that up. I'm so embarrassed. Oh, well, you know, kind of just that we all do it, I think. But I love yeah. that what you're saying about role modeling and not emphasizing the outcome. And I think it's hard to do because, you know, sometimes you're genuinely proud of your kid. They do, you know, one of my kids came home with a score on a test and I was like, oh, wow. You know, it was kind of like surprisingly, she did really well on it. And I felt like, oh, that's so cool. But it's like, you don't want to make too big of a deal about that because that implies that the other times when she doesn't, you know, is like bad. And that is definitely not the message that is going to that you want to give them, right? Yeah, it's hard. yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think kids pick up on these patterns really well, even if we don't intend for them to. And I really like what you said about being willing to make mistakes. I think it's that like showing that, you know, quote, weak side of ourselves that we all want to hide. We always want to show people when we're doing really well. Like, I mean, just thinking about social media, that's the best example. Like we all want to show when we're just like, you know, achieving and all that. And I think, yeah, with our, even with kid with kids, just sharing that, like I had a really rough day and, you know, that's just part of, part of life, right? Like we don't only talk about good things. There's space for difficult times and enjoyable times. So I, I yeah, I think that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I like the metaphor in the book about trying to do things perfectly and avoiding mistakes as a game. Like it's a game that we're trying playing, kind of trying to win the game. Uh, could you kind of walk through that concept of how perfectionism can be like a game and, and you know, what, well, I'll just stop there. That idea of what, um, of thinking about perfectionism as, as it's like playing a game. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think part of that metaphor is like the transactional nature of perfectionism, right? It's like, I, I like hit my forehand and then I like win a point, right? Like I stay up till midnight to finish the report and then I get praise. It's like, I think part of it is sort of um, describing the transactional nature, but I think the, the heart of the metaphor is taking a step back and examining is this, a game well first is it a game that I can win and second is it a game that I want to win I think like being able to step back and explore those bigger questions because they like a common I don't know if it's common I guess a metaphor I've heard used in act is like that we're playing a rigged game right like in perfectionism we're almost always outscored by perfectionism right like we don't get the the prom like the promised reward Right. Like, so it says like, okay, like once you get 20 publications, you'll feel like you're good enough. And that never happens. Right. Like once you get like this grant, then you'll think you're a good researcher. And that promise, like, you know, so we work really hard because it's like, now I'm going to feel like I'm competent. Like it doesn't actually happen. So it's a game that is kind of unfair. It's like those rigged carnival games where it's like, oh no, if you try like one more time, the ball will go into the hoop. And it's like, but is that really how the game works? And everything in our rational, logical mind is like, it should work because that would make sense. And I think part of it is listening to your experience playing the game. It's like, okay, there's logic, but also you've played this game for 20 years. Like that's a lot of valuable data. And what does your experience tell you about if this is a winnable game? And I think another thing with perfectionism is like the rules are always changing too, right? It's like, Oh, like, okay, you think you're good at this, but are you good at this other thing? Um, and so it just creates new criteria for us to fulfill. Um, but then I think even beyond that, it's what are you going to get if you win this game? 
like what what is that what is that thing that you're holding out for that is making all these hours you're spending playing the game worth it because those hours and the, the energy the attention could have gone to something else right but we're kind of betting on like the prize I get is going to be worth it. It's going to be worth those missed dinners with my family. It's going to be worth like um, not like watching any movies while I was in college. And so I think, um, so I think, yeah, that's sort of how I see the metaphor is more like to um, help us reflect on these bigger questions. Cause we, you know, if we're in a game, we just assume, of course you want to win, but that may not be like a fair assumption. Right. Because A, it keeps on going. You never really truly win that game. And then that idea of what's the price of playing the game? Like, what are you not doing if you're in that mode? And like you said, for 20 years, you can be so fixated on winning the game that you'll never, you'll never win, but you're also consumed by the game to the point where you're not doing other things you might rather be doing. It's like that video game. You can't stop playing even though you know you probably should. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it just feels like every time you play, you're getting closer and closer. And that's kind of what keeps you going. Yeah. There's a quote in your book. I actually wrote it down because I, it was so powerful, which says, as long as you're playing the game of perfectionism, you're losing. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> what are you losing? I mean, what are you, what do you think? Like, what do people lose when they're trapped by perfectionism? Yeah. Um, I think, I feel like that's a like question that I would hope people like allow themselves to be open and vulnerable enough to like grapple with. Cause so I can say personally, like, you know, I'm maybe, well, I guess it's not personally, but like I could see like, you know, I'm losing like deeper relationships. I'm losing moments of being present, right? Like I think about, um, like I had a client where they struggle with perfectionism and they don't even remember like their kid's wedding because the entire time they're worrying about like the 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 plate setting and the flowers and are things going on schedule. And that was like a huge regret for them because it's like, I only remember it because of the videos and the photos, but I like don't remember being there. And so that's the stuff I think we miss. And like, really we miss living. It like, we miss all these precious moments where, you know, maybe it's like, you know, the weather is really nice and we just want to be outside or we want to go skiing. Um, So yeah, I think it, I think it's a hard question to face. That's a beautiful answer because that's such, those are such painful examples. And I think you're right that everybody has to answer that question for themselves a little bit because it, it depends. And, and if you're not losing anything, then fine, keep playing the game. You know, exactly. there's no problem there. But I think for a lot of people who get in that cycle, there is a, a loss to it. That's, yeah, that's where it's, yeah, the painful part, the pain of missing out can be, or the pain of getting trapped in the struggle can be. Yeah. Mm. Well, we talked a little bit earlier about rules and how we can sometimes get rigid about those kind of internal rules, you know, like I have to have zero unread emails, I have to be caught up on laundry, I have to meet this deadline or that deadline. And sometimes when we have rules, I think it can be hard to let go of those. And also, it can limit us in terms of feeling like we have a choice. And I recently, uh, I guess a couple months ago, I had Aprilia West on the podcast, and she kind of challenged me a little bit about that um, and this idea of the language of choice, because I think sometimes we almost feel like it's not a choice when we're really rigid about our rules, like I must do this or that. So do you have any words of wisdom about how we can move more from rigidity into looking at choice and just being a little bit more flexible around loosening up on perfectionism? Yeah, Yeah, I think 
for me, the first thing I think of is identifying the rules in the first place. Because it's kind of like if we don't know we're following a I have to or I should, then it's, I don't know, it's kind of like swimming in water or, you know, like we just don't know that it's there. So I think before anything, it's recognizing I have to. Um, and once we realize, oh, okay, there's a rule saying, you know, I should brush my teeth every night. Then from there, then I can take a step back and say, like, okay, like I, I could brush my teeth every night or I could not, right? Like, why would I choose to brush my teeth every night? Like, what are the consequences? And I think this is just like a, a, a really an oversimplification. But I think what comes down to a have to is I'm unwilling to bear the consequences, right? Like when I say like, I have to graduate from grad school because I spent like five years, you know, in, in grad school already, it's like, I'm unwilling to bear the consequence of losing all the, these years of work. And so I have to, but really it's, there's nothing, there's nothing I have to do. Like I, if I'm willing to bear the consequence, then I can easily drop out or at least, you know, I can willingly drop out. So I think, and I think that's okay. Like, like certain things we choose to do because the consequence of not doing it is so huge. Like I have to go visit like my relative who's in the hospital because I'm unwilling to bear the consequence of missing out that moment that, you know, potential last moments with them. I think just being really explicit about like, it's not, I have to, it's I choose to. And I think, I don't, I feel like, but just the awareness of the rules in the first place for me tends to be the most helpful. Oh yeah. I like that. Like I have to get organized or I have to plan everything out or, I mean, back to my example of this coming weekend, it's like that consequence. So if I do all my, you know, things in my personal life and spend time with my family, get stuff done around my house, the consequence is I'll feel a little behind on work Monday morning. And, but to think that that is a choice, you know, and one way or the other, you know, I get to make that choice. Yeah. Yeah. Like all choices have consequences and I think just recognizing there are certain consequences we don't want to bear and that's perfectly okay. Yeah. And it's also awareness. I think you're within that you're making room for different feelings, right? That, which is part of your book is about acceptance and making room for different feelings and also being aware of your thoughts and those kind of self stories that kind of limit you. And so I think people who want to learn more about that, you have some terrific chapters about some ways to do that, to notice those self stories and to, to unhook a little bit from self criticism and be a little bit kinder toward yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah, it's a difficult skill, being kinder to yourself. Yeah. You have some wonderful ideas for some of the ways to to work with perfectionism using this ACT approach. And I think one of the things that's really foundational in any ACT approach, but that's also really relevant to, per, to perfectionists, um, perfectionism is just this idea of getting caught in a struggle, right? And how we get so, when we're in that place of really struggling with our emotions or with something like perfectionism, it can be really hard to move out of that. So could you give our listeners some thoughts if they really identify with that idea of being caught in an anxiety and perfectionism struggle, how would you look at that and what might be helpful for them if they're in that place? Yeah, I think, um, as you said that the metaphor that came to mind was like being in quicksand, right? The like feeling like we're struggling and the thing that feels most helpful to do is struggle. Like just the, the logical thing feels like I need to swim out of this. And that the way anxiety and perfectionism work is that the more you struggle, the more entangled you get and the harder it is to get out of whatever situation that you're in. So the thing I think about is like just looking at what's around you and honestly assessing for yourself, like, is this where I want to be? Is the direction that I'm going going to take me to where I want to end up in, you know, 30, 40 years, right? So for example, I might say at the end of my life, I want to be surrounded by people who I love and care about. But if I look at my behavior, I think I'm going to be surrounded by like 
publications, <laughs> and I don't really care <laughs> about being surrounded by pieces of paper. Publications don't love you back, right? Exactly, exactly. So like that kind of helps me to just reflect on, okay, like just an honest assessment of where I am right now and where do I want to go from here. And like, if, you know, going back to the quicksand idea, it's that before anything, like, let's just stop struggling. Or like, even before we devise the like, how do I like, you know, find a plank or whatever? It's like the first thing is just stop struggling. And I think that's really scary because like I mentioned, there's a protective function of perfectionism. It feels good or it feels safer that I'm do at least I'm doing something. Right, like at least I'm not just doing nothing because that would be the worst thing. And I think it's reflecting on is your doing something like actually helpful? Like it is possible that doing something is actively unhelpful. So I think almost starting there and empowering your ourselves with choice of like I can choose my next step, even if it's really uncomfortable. Even if my mind is like yelling at me, like, don't you dare, like, you don't even know what's going to happen. And like, I don't know, just feel like being able to recognize that the choice is yours to make, even though it's hard to believe, I think. Yeah, I love that. And then, then that frees you up so much. And even if all kinds of things show up when you're, when you're first letting go of the struggle, and then you can kind of move in these directions and, you know, toward values and toward that life you want to live. Yeah. Yeah. And even just asking, like, what is that life I want to live? Because I think sometimes we don't know. We think we should know, but sometimes we don't. If there are any, any, um, you know, self-described anxious perfectionists listening who are out of contact with that, who are like, I don't actually... I've heard that from some clients, if they could drop the expectations, if they could drop the shoulds and the perfectionism, what would they do instead? And and if someone's really, really in that place of struggle, sometimes they're like, I don't know. What would you do to help a client maybe or a friend who's who's in that place to, to begin to think about the life they want to live? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I think especially for clients, I try to think about going to experience rather than like like intellectualizing values. So it could be like just reflect on, I don't know, past year, past two years. What are moments where you felt like really connected and present and engaged and like and I think I get a little bit like hippie-ish when I talk about values. <laughs> but like it's this sense of like just this feels nice. This feels right. This just feels like where I want to be. And like that can sort of be where you start. And then going forward, again, like listen to your experience, like try out different things. I think perfectionism, again, is going to say like, well, then figure out your values. Then we'll do that. Like easy, like step one, figure out your values. And the thing is like, sometimes we need to, you know, like just try out different things and things might show up that we don't expect because uh, values aren't logical. Like, so for example, I recently like could admit to myself that one of my values is aestheticism. And I, and I never thought that was a real thing. And I was like, no, like, like in the values card sort, there's like beauty. And I was like, oh, this is just like a trick value. It's like not actually real. And I, I don't know. It was just after, like through some like self-reflection, I was like, hey, this actually... Like, yeah, I like having this in my life. I like my life more when I like follow this value, like having art, you know, or something. And I didn't realize that until I just sort of experimented around and like was able to connect with just my own like experience and the feedback that I was getting from how I was reacting to different things. But I would never have logically figured that out. In fact, logically, it doesn't even make sense. I don't know to me or to my mind. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have seen that so many times when people determine some type of value and then just almost get perfectionistic or rule or develop a rule about that value. Like now that I know this value, I must do this value every single day, no matter what. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, that that loses the vitality to it. Then it's like, yeah. 
It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vitality is such a good word for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, on a final note, before we wrap up, let's just make a little, let's just make a little room for the topic of self-kindness, um, which is sort of where your book ends too. And I think it's just absolutely really important with perfectionism because it, you know, you, I think when people are in that place of perfectionism, like we can be so mean to ourselves. Yeah. How can yeah. people just move a little gentle nudge toward self-kindness? Um, yeah, I think that's really, um, I think that's such a, like, yeah, big question for like, it's a big question. Sorry to lob a huge question at you here. (laughs) No, no, no. More just like, it's such an important one and a good one. Um, I think the things that have helped me, I think are one, like, from kind of thinking of self kindness or self compassion as a choice, not as a feeling not as an earned thing. It's just something we can choose to do. Like we can choose to walk to the store or we can choose to, you know, get water. Like we can choose to do something nice for ourselves. And there's just going to be so much pushback of like, but you, you know, but you haven't finished your assignment. You haven't replied all your emails. You can't go and like get a donut. Um, But I think kind of holding, like holding on to the idea that I can choose to do this, even if I feel like I don't deserve it. I can still choose to do it. Um, I think sometimes perspective taking is helpful around like, what would I say to a friend Um, and kind of treating ourselves like we would treat a friend. Um, I think the other thing that helps me is thinking of self-kindness as a skill. So what I like about that is that means um, I can get better at it and it makes sense why I suck at it. (laughs) Right. Cause I haven't done it before and it's new. So of course I'm going to suck at it. And the more I practice, the better I'm going to get. So I feel like thinking of it as a skill kind of helps me a lot. I love that. It's a skill and it's something that can be practiced and learned. Yeah. Absolutely. Like flossing. We don't have to like yes. doing it, but we can still choose to do it. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Well, Clarissa, thank you so much again for joining us. And again, your book is called The Anxious Perfectionist, How to Manage Perfectionism-Driven Anxiety Using Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. It's a terrific book for those who want to learn more. Check it out. And um, Clarissa, thank you so much for joining us. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. I'm glad we got to talk. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Connect with us on social media and purchase swag from our merch store by going to our website at offtheclockpsych.com slash merch. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, our dissemination coordinator, Katie Rothfelder, and our editorial coordinator, Melissa Miller. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.